Uh, but I appreciate so much him flying up to be with us this evening in his busy schedule. I appreciate what he's done through the years and especially uh, the case that he took that he will be talking to us about tonight and the ramifications of that. I've tried for years to get his dad to make a video of those humorous stories that he tells. I wish you'd twist his arm. That's something that does not need to go out. We do not need to lose when he chooses to go to heaven. I have never laughed as hard in my life as I've laughed at some of those. And by the way, he didn't have to make it up. It's actual happenings to him. And everybody, before they go to heaven, ought to hear some of these stories. And I wish some way that he would just, if nowhere else, the next time he's here, we'd be glad to video it. And just just put that down for next generation and future generations uh, to hear. I promise you, it would be better than Andy Griffin. Uh, if he did so. But what great people these people are. They're great because they recognize they serve a great Lord and they have allowed His greatness to be manifested through them. So we're honored tonight to have Dr. David Gibbs III with us. And I want you to welcome him tonight as he comes to speak to us at this time. Very thank you. We love you. Thank you. Please be seated. It's my delight to be here. Thank you very much. Please be seated. I'm thrilled to be a friend of your pastor. How many here love and appreciate your pastor? And, and what a now give him a hand for sure. What a phenomenal man of God. And uh, doing a great work, not just in this church, in this community, around your state, but literally around the nation. And I appreciate your pastor and his dear wife and his leadership and coming each and every week and blessing you with the teaching of the Word of God. It's indeed my privilege to be in his pulpit and to be his friend. Uh, I bring you greetings from my dad. How many have heard my dad before? I guess many of you, most of you. Uh, my dad had a birthday yesterday. He turned 62. Uh, he is healthy, in good spirits, and uh, he gives his uh, warm regards. Uh, how many thought he was older than 62? Anybody thought he was older? How many thought he was way younger than 62? Oh, you're not going to get You know now. You know, you're going to get in trouble. Uh, but uh, he is doing well, and uh, he and my mom are almost empty nesters. Uh, my youngest brother got married this summer, and uh, he's still at the house with his new bride for another week till they go finish Bible college, and so uh, they're going into a new phase of life, but doing well, and they send their love and greetings. Uh, for those of you that don't know me very well, I had a little bit of an unusual family. I had a three-year-old daughter, Heather, and then I had a one-year-old daughter, Heidi. And we were expecting what we thought was going to be child number three. Now, you know how this goes. You have two little girls. You kind of root for a little boy, but whatever the Lord gives you would be wonderful. We went into the doctor for that ultrasound. How many know what ultrasound I'm talking about? It's the one where they'll tell you. And we always had a simple premise that the doctor knows we want to know. And uh, we went in. Doc turned and smiled real big. He said, Mr. Gibbs, how would you like to have two you're having twins. And a few months after that, David, a little boy, and Danielle, a little girl, were born. Now, do the math quickly. Four kids ages three and under. I do you think our house was hopping for a while, all right? Uh, we had a good time. Kids are a little older now. Heather's almost 12. Heidi's 10. The twins are 8. How many here are parents? I'm going to see your hand if you're a mom or dad. Oh, most of the adults here. How many parents have ever been tempted to murder your own offspring? May I see your hand, please? That, that temptation can cross your path every once in a while. Uh, my daughter, Danielle, the youngest twin, was with my wife in a vehicle. And Danielle makes this comment from the back of the car. She says, Mommy, I've only got one mommy, but I've got two daddies. And for just a moment, this comment upset my wife, trying to figure out what the little girl was talking about. She was talking about her heavenly father. But here's what she said. She said, Mommy, I've got a heavenly father, and I've got a homely father. <laughs> and out of the mouths of children, you just never know what will proceed next. 
Tonight I'd like to share with you a little bit of an unusual message. I'm going to tell you about the Terry Schiavo case. And I'm going to let you kind of get an inside look at what happened in this case. And then at the end, we're going to look to the Word of God and we are going to pull some lessons and maybe together learn from this tragedy. It's been a little over a year and a half. Terry Schiavo literally transcended in early 2005 from being a interesting case because it was being debated in legal circles to becoming legal news and then national news. And as many of you saw, literally, it became the number one news story for the world. And people from all around the globe, world leaders and the President of the United States, the Congress and others, all weighed in on this case. What should happen? This girl, this disabled woman, the husband wants her to die, the parents want her to live, and how should we handle this as a nation? And you saw some interesting things. It's the only issue in my lifetime where I've ever seen Jesse Jackson and Rush Limbaugh agree on something. Uh, Mr. Jackson proudly declares himself a liberal. Mr. Limbaugh obviously professes to be a conservative, and yet they both agree that Terry Schiavo should live. Uh, interesting, as it's now a major political issue, um, the entire United States Senate unanimously voted to pass a law to save Terry. And so there were Democrats as liberal as Clinton or Kennedy or others that obviously saw the concern of this disabled woman losing her life, and what did that mean? And as this case worked its way along, it really hubbed off of two major issues. Issue number one was, what was Terry's condition? I mean, what, what was she? And then number two, what were Terry's wishes? Under the circumstances, what would Terry want? And as you think about those two issues, I think there's some lessons that each of us can learn that may help us in our own lives. Clearly, we understand that if someone is dead, it makes no sense to rush in and try to keep a corpse alive. Uh, you're in a very safe building right here, so this is not a good example. But if something were to fall from the ceiling, and all of a sudden sever my head from my body. All of a sudden my body's over here, my head's over there. I'm going to understand that would be a fairly bad day for me. At that point, most people would say, Mr. Gibbs, you just died. I mean, your head is now over there, your body's over here. But we have apparatus, we have machines that could be hooked up to the neck down. You could put a ventilator, you could put a heart machine, you could put things onto my corpse, my dead body, and you could keep it functioning. And everyone would say, Mr. Gibbs, that's kind of a waste of time because you're dead. Your, your head's over there, you're dead. Uh, your body, I mean, we can make your lungs beat, we can keep your heart working for a while, but there's no point in it. And clearly, that is an issue that many people face in their families. They generally call them end-of-life issues. You know, someone is on a ventilator, on a heart machine, and that's all that's keeping them alive. They've already passed, and, and people have to make some very, very difficult end-of-life decisions, trying to know when is the person dead, and when do they have a chance at remaining alive. And a lot of people want to put Terry Schiavo into that category. They want to call it an end-of-life case. Could I caution you slightly? Terry Schiavo was not an end-of-life case. She was as alive as any person sitting in this room. Her heart worked. Her lungs worked. She had no disease, no cancer, no Alzheimer's, nothing was in her body that was ending her life. And so Terry Schiavo was not an end-of-life case. Terry Schiavo was a case where the decision was made to end her life. And you say, well, how would they do that? They made a determination that there wasn't enough quality to her life. 
Now, how many think that's a dangerous determination for anybody to make? You say, well, Mr. Gibbs, I heard terms like brain dead or vegetable or, you know, just completely incoherent. I mean, what kind of shape was Terry Schiavo in? Very interesting, because the first time I went to see Terry, I had heard all of these same things. I mean, you see the local paper, and it was moving to get more attention, but it was still kind of an issue. And, you know, I really wondered if this girl was really already gone, and maybe the parents were struggling to hang on, and I was helping them, but I wanted to see Terry for myself. I wanted to see what she would do or how she would act. or And I expected kind of a medically severe scene. I don't know why. I thought maybe like an emergency room and doctors and monitors and, you know, something there that would be, you know, looking like she was on life support. Was I in for a surprise? Walk in the room. Terry Schiavo is sitting in a lazy boy chair with absolutely nothing hooked up to her all by herself listening to the radio. And I mean, I walk in and I, I mean, I'm kind of like stunned. I mean, there's absolutely nothing required to keep her alive. Her only life support is she needed help with food and water. Now, how many of you here need food and water to remain alive? May I see your hand, please? Sure. Uh, if you didn't raise your hand, be careful. You need food and water. Everybody does. Uh, that your body is not designed to go protracted periods without food or water. And Terry Schiavo had a disability where her arms did not work under her own control as well as she would have wanted. She could tug at her blanket. She could move things. She held animals. She liked stuffed animals. They were a comfort to her. She would fuss with them. But she could not control her arms well enough, like most of you can, to pick up food and put it into her own mouth. So that then creates two choices. Number one, you could have another able-bodied person feed her. And Terry was perfectly capable of eating. She swallowed. You give her things to drink. I mean, she had no problem ingesting food. Now, why wouldn't you want to stand there and feed her? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, it's slow. Uh, when you're feeding another human being, trying to get enough of the right things into their system, not giving them too much. And then also, number two, there's always a risk of what they call aspiration. Uh, when you feed yourself, you're watching more carefully that you don't put things into your lungs and it goes into your stomach. When another person is being fed, you have to be careful that if they start to choke, you don't, you know, continue to feed them and, and cause injury to them. So it's a, a slow and a little bit of a tedious process. And so many years ago, the doctor said, what you need to do is have a feeding tube. Now, let me explain what that is. It's a little port in your stomach. It's very minor surgery. And a couple times a day, I viewed it like an IV. They come in and feed you. They hook up, boom, a couple hours, you're fed, they're done completely balanced, completely safe, it doesn't in any way go by your lungs. And that was the only thing that Terry Schiavo needed to remain alive, food and water. When I'm in there, she's not eating, so she's just sitting there in the chair and listening to the radio. Now, I'm thinking to myself, I've heard terms like a vegetable, I mean, see with my own eyes, she's alive. But, I mean, I've heard non-responsive, that she's just going to... And so I walk in with Mary Schindler, who was Terry's mom. And as Mary makes the turn to get into Terry's line of sight, Terry Schiavo squeals and gets all excited and lunges forward in the chair, clearly recognizing mom. Mary walks over and says, Terry, good to see you. I'm here with some friends, honey. And she would caress her head and get up close, and Mary would kiss Terry. And Terry would turn and kiss her mother back. Now, not maybe as uh, cleanly as you may be able to control your mouth to kiss. I would describe it more like a nibble. Uh, she would turn and she would mouth and kind of gnaw and chew on her mother's cheek in response to the kiss. And she says, now, Terry, this is an exciting day. I've brought some people that haven't met you before. Can you show them what you can do? And I mean, please understand, Mary is a stay-at-home mom 
Her daughter is there, 40 years old at this time, and, you know, this is not in any way a therapist, anyone that's trained with any specialty in this, but she would try to help teach Terry things. And she said, Terry, I want you to say I for Mr. Gibbs. And in obedience to her mom, Terry goes, I, and turns and smiles. Okay, that's good, Terry. Now I want you to say love. And I mean, Mary says it, and Terry, love. Oh, that's good, Terry. Now I want you to say you. And Terry never got the use. I don't know if the sound was difficult, but she'd look up at her mom, and, and all of a sudden Mary said, that's good, Terry. Let's do it again. I. And I mean, Terry would obey and say basic words. I watched her do it hundreds of times. Bob Schindler, the dad, a little different personality, a little crustier just in teasing. He had a mustache. Sometimes he didn't shave his chin as cleanly. And he'd come in and say, okay, honey, now I want you to pucker up and give your daddy a kiss. You know, I mean, she would get excited and kiss mom. Every single time he'd start coming at her for the kiss with that mustache, she would purse up her face, make this lemon face, and turn her head away and giggle like she didn't want the kiss. The radio. People would come in and they'd think, you know, hey, she's a vegetable, we can do whatever we want, and they'd flip her radio dial. She liked basically what I would call classical, kind of instrumental, probably more soothing, more relaxing to listen to over a protracted time period, not a lot of chit-chat. And so she liked the classical music. Well, they'd come flip the radio dial. They'd flip it to whatever they wanted to listen to, and guess what? Terry Schiavo would fuss at them and squawk till they would turn it back. Standing in the room, Mary Schindler goes out in the hallway. And there are other people there, and Terry Schiavo starts crying. Great big tears running down her cheek. She would do that just about every time her mother would leave. Great squeals of delight, kisses when mom shows up, tears and upset every time mom would leave. I thought, I wonder if she pays attention. She liked my voice. It was kind of loud, and I was probably a new person in her world. And so I would chit-chat a little bit. And, I mean, Terry paid a lot of attention, followed me closely. I thought, yeah, I wonder if she really is focusing on me. So I thought, I'll do what would be rude if I had done it to you. She's in this chair. And there was just a little bit of room, but I could get behind it. So, I mean, I'm talking to Terry, and I just basically went completely out of her line of sight, went behind the chair, and I'm now standing kind of over her, talking from what would be basically her blind side. Terry Schiavo flips around in the chair and follows me and twists around so she can still stay connected and look at what I'm saying. Now, is she brain injured? No question. Uh, did she suffer a disability? Yes. Uh, would I wish Terry Shivo to have better health? Certainly. Would any parent want their child to have the best health? And the people sitting here, I hope you have good health and length of days. But here was someone that was as alive as any person sitting here. And the only thing needed to keep her alive is food and water. You say, well, Mr. Gibbs, that's troubling, and I mean... I know there were neurologists and others who weighed in, but you said the second thing we got to think about, too, is what would Terry want? Now, please understand, there's two sides to this, okay? There's a legal side, and the law is that you can make some choices uh, in your medical treatment, even if it's not in your best interest. And then there's what I would call the biblical side. And how many understand there's a whole Christian side to what you should or should not do with your life? But from a legal side for just a moment, the thought is if somebody says, starve me to death, I know it doesn't seem right, but you can make that poor choice for yourself. And so a question is, did Terry make that choice? Absolutely no writing whatsoever. Not any living will, not any document, nothing in print that would in any way say, I don't want to live. I want to have food and water pulled away from me. And so there's absolutely nothing from Terry. Then you have this strange timeline. Terry collapsed in 1990. Uh, nobody quite knows what happened to her, otherwise healthy 26-year-old girl. Temporary deprivation of oxygen and blood flow to her brain. And that created the disability. 
at the time, interestingly, she went into a coma. At the time, she was put on ventilators and heart machines. At the time, everybody thought she was going to die. Her husband said, do everything, and this is the husband in cooperation with the parents, do everything you can to keep her alive. And wonderfully, Terry pulled through. Uh, she was disabled, but she lived and would continue to live till the year 2005. Early years, the husband is very doting. Everything he can to try to help her, he even turns around and sues doctors. Uh, proceeds to get a jury award of multi-million of dollars. The jury gets told with the family sitting there from the mouth of the husband, I want to take care of my wife for the rest of her life. And that was the commitment that the jury awarded the money. 1993, the money comes in from that day till the day she died. Michael Shivo would never use any of that money for Terry's care, rehabilitation, therapy. It was sort of like a little light switch went off. Uh, other factors came into play. He got a girlfriend. Uh, how many understand a disabled wife is a problem when you have a new girlfriend? And all of a sudden, life is moving in different directions for him, and he now decides, you know what? Terry wouldn't want to live like this. And he takes all that money allocated for Terry's care and begins to use that to hire lawyers to advocate for her death. The family says, this is crazy. I, I can't believe in America. I mean, we'll take care of our daughter. Don't, don't kill Terry. A judge in the year 2000 proceeds to rule, you know what, I don't see any quality in her life, and it's okay. The husband can proceed to pull the food and water and have her die. You say, Mr. Gibbs, how could a judge do that? I don't know. Interestingly, in this case, this judge never went to see Terry. Never saw her, never had her in the courtroom. Um, you would think if you were going to decide whether a person lives or dies, the least you would do is go look at her with her mother one time. You would think that if, if you don't even view Terry as a person, if all you view her is as evidence, you would think certainly you'd have the evidence brought to the courtroom so you could look for yourself before you would issue this decision. It was appeal that was battled, the parents lost. And the year 2003, they came to me and said, Mr. Gibbs, our daughter is set to die in just a couple of days. Do you think there's anything that you could do to help? Now, please understand, from a legal standpoint, this is a bad case. They'd lost. They'd lost on appeal. They didn't have any money or anything that they could muster forward. And really, their legal avenues looked about closed. And I said, Bob, Mary, I said, legally, it looks pretty difficult. But we serve a God who can do the impossible. How many believe we serve that kind of God? And we watch God do some wonderful things. At this point, the Florida legislature took some legislation we drafted and actually passed a law that was later called Terry's Law. And simply put, it made Governor Bush, uh, the president's brother, the governor of the state of Florida, the guardian over Terry. And so he said, we want to preserve her life. And he was now the guardian, and it looked like Terry's life would be preserved. Tragically, in the year 2004, that law was overturned by the Florida Supreme Court. And they said, no, we don't think this is constitutional. We don't want the governor stepping in and saving this girl as he has. And then you saw the flurry of last-minute activity all through 2004, early 2005, where the case was battled through every possible appeal. Uh, interestingly, Terry never had the updated MRI scans or other things that would really let you know how she was functioning. And then March of 2005, it looked like Terry was going to die once again. Uh, enter the United States Congress. Uh, Congress came together and passed a law hoping to give Terry what we give to every convicted criminal in the United States of America who's sentenced to die. I don't know if you know, but when someone is sentenced to die in the United States of America for committing horrible crimes, uh, murderers, people that have done capital offenses, they are entitled to what they call a habeas procedure. And that procedure is simply put, you go over to the federal court system 
and you make sure that the state did everything right before you kill someone. And it's established in our law. What the Congress said is, we should do that for Terry Scheibel. Before this innocent woman dies, shouldn't we at least give her as much protection as we give to these capital killers? Now, how many think that makes a little sense? I mean, you understand, if Terry Shiva was a dog, Michael Shiva would be in jail for killing her. You understand, if she was a capital offense, if she killed somebody or if she was a terrorist, she would be protected and alive today. And so the Congress said, this isn't right. The president signed it in the law, and we were in federal court with what we thought was our second miracle. Uh, we had this case, and it set a record. Only case in United States history to go to the United States Supreme Court and back twice in 10 days. It moved at an unbelievable pace. Please understand, any one of these courts could have sat on it. Uh, the Supreme Court monitored it. It was being received by email. It was kind of unprecedented, probably never happened again in terms of the speed with which this moved through. Uh, literally, hours, be, you know, please have your brief ready in four hours. And, I mean, it was just moving at this incredible pace as these judges tried to decide. But you know what happened? They said the Congress should not get involved. And they rendered basically as a nullity everything that had been done. And they said that original judge's ruling back in 2000 will stand and Terry Schiavo will die. And within just a few hours, about eight hours after her final Supreme Court appeal had expired, Terry Schiavo died on March the 31st of 2005, um, 13 days without water and food in the United States of America. You say, well, Mr. Gibbs, I understand that, but, you know, I mean, it's kind of peaceful. I mean, you know, I, I feel bad. It's probably tough for the parents. But, I mean, you know, death by dehydration, I mean, it, it's not that bad. I was in the room with Terry the last time her mom would see her alive. Didn't know it was going to be the last time because... Mary Schindler would reach a decision she couldn't go back. It was just too hard. And she said, David, would you go over with me? Now, I was glad to go to be an encouragement to her. I enjoyed visiting Terry. Obviously, now it was getting sad because her health was in serious decline. But what it was was a request, in a sense, to get through the zoo, just to put a perspective in it in a space about the size of this auditorium outdoors uh, was every network in the world, hundreds of cameras and photographers, hundreds of protesters, and hundreds of police. So imagine just 600, 800, just chaos everywhere. And so you walk through all this, and I mean, Mary Schindler to go see her own daughter as she was dying, multiple police checks, completely frisked, everything in her pockets, no items with her whatsoever, is allowed then through the building and is checked again at the door, and then there's an armed police officer with her the entire time to make sure that in no way does she provide any comfort or food to her own daughter. As we start into this room, and it was the same room we'd been in many times before, the first thing you notice is the sound. Terry's breathing has now, what I mean by that is when you breathe, you take in air, you exhale, but it's reasonably quiet. When your body is struggling and beginning to die, you move into what they call the death pant. And what that is, it's, it's gaspy. The body's clamoring for oxygen and things it's not getting. And, and the only way to describe it is like a dog uh, on a hot day that's exerted. They can't. And, but it's noisy. And, I mean, you, as you walk into the room, you, you hear this gaspy, loud breathing. As I looked at Terry as her mom began to make her way to the bed, all the pulp, all the health had been pulled out of her face. You saw her on TV as they would show some of the images that they had. She was a reasonably attractive lady for her disability, and kept herself well in terms of her hair and her face and all the color, all the 
fat of the face was gone. It looked for all the world like you'd taken skin and just stretched it over a skeleton. Every crevice of the cheek, the whole jawbone, everything is, again, the body's losing hydration, so it's shrinking in on itself. Her face is kind of looks sunburned, dry, peely, red, splotchy. Underneath her eyes, as you go from her eyes to like her nose, it looks like two big black eyes. Again, the face is sinking in on itself and looks like you punched her right under the eyes. Her lips are all parched and I, as have you, have seen dry lips. I, in my life, had never seen a peeling tongue. I'd never seen the roof of a mouth that was flaking and literally coming apart from lack of water. As Mary Schindler walked up, she began to kiss and cry, talk and pray over her daughter, Terry. Oh, God, please don't let Terry feel this. And then she'd kind of flip to start talking to Terry. Honey, we love you. Don't fight, honey. It's okay. You'll be with God soon. And all of a sudden, I'm standing at the foot of this bed. And I'm watching this girl that just a few weeks earlier would have squealed and been all excited and been following me around. And she's laying in this bed, completely dehydrated and dying. Her mother's standing there with court orders and armed police to make sure she doesn't do what's in every mother's instinct, to help your own daughter. And standing there, I am a Christian school graduate. I am patriotic. I love the United States of America. But standing there was the first time in my life I was terrifically embarrassed for our nation. I thought, in God's name, what are we doing? you got a mom and a dad that want to take care of this girl. And instead of doing what we would do to foster life, we're literally watching her die. Mary Schindler would stay in that room probably about 20, maybe 30 minutes. Cry, pray, talk. I really didn't think Terry had any energy left. I mean, she was obviously very weak. It's interesting. Um, they had her on high levels of morphine for the pain. On one hand, she's a vegetable. On the other hand, we don't want her to feel all this pain. Um, not to, you know, make it unduly graphic, but just so you know, death by dehydration, your body goes in on itself. Ultimately, your internal organs begin to swell from lack of water. And why they put you on all these pain, it's the most painful death imaginable. Your heart will not die. It explodes. It literally disintegrates into a massive um, heart failure at an unbelievable level. And that's why they don't do it to animals. That's why they don't do it to criminals. That's why they don't do it to terrorists, because it's very barbaric, very painful. And so with all the drugs and with all the, uh, that she'd been through, I really didn't expect anything out of Terry. But about halfway through the time, Terry's eyes got real big. And she looked over at her mom. And this was the only time I saw this happen. Terry always got excited to see Mom and cried when she left. This was the only time I saw Terry cry when her mom showed up and was upset. And I know some of the tears were Mary's, but one or two little tears out of that dehydrated body running down the dry skin of her face as she sat there dying with her mom having to watch it. Mary would walk out. I would join her in the hallway. Mary looked up at me. She said, David, I'm no lawyer. She said, I'm no doctor. 
But she said, what I don't understand is why do they have to kill my little girl? I said, Mary, I am a lawyer, and I'm not a doctor. But it sure doesn't make any sense. And you know, Mary would never go back in to see Terry again. She said, it's just too hard. I can't. And a couple days later, she'd see her daughter again, but this time as a corpse. The media covered it, as you know, almost insatiably, round the clock. And the U.S. media was interested in the details. You know, what are you going to do next? What do you think of the president or the Congress? Or they like the, what I call the ticky-tacky. International media didn't care. International media didn't even understand the legal stuff all that much. What they knew was disabled woman, going to die, president tried to stop it, and couldn't. That was kind of what they understood. And here were some of the questions I got asked by German media, Australian media, Asia, all over Africa, Central South America, literally hundreds and hundreds of countries. Kind of unbelievable how television and the Internet have permeated the world. Mr. Gibbs, is America in Afghanistan and Iraq because it's the right thing to do? Sure. Did America in World War II go to stop the Nazis because it was the right thing to do? Yeah. Is it the right thing to do to let this girl die? Australian Today Show did your founding fathers talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Mr. Gibbs, by what moral authority do they let this girl die? And how many understand there is no moral authority to do to Terry Schiavo what we did? You say, Mr. Gibbs, it's a... A sad case, but I don't know. I mean, I, I look at one side. I wouldn't ever want to live like that. And we sometimes will take that comment and we spiritualize it a touch. I wouldn't want to be a burden on my family. I wouldn't want to have my kids see me like that. Now, could I give you just a couple of thoughts? Number one, how many understand you don't know what you want until you're in that situation? I mean, if somebody says to me right now, do you want to be in a wheelchair? I give you the answer, no. But you know, if God puts me in a wheelchair, then that's where I need to be. I mean, clearly, you don't know what you want until you're in the situation. But then could I give you one other thought? How many understand it's God that put you in that situation? situation. How many believe God is the giver of all life? And how many believe God is the allower of any disability? And you know, if he allows something into our life, whether it's a small ache in the knee or back, or whether it's a major handicap like what Terry Schiavo had to face, how many believe it's our purpose to find God's purpose in each and every life? And so I caution you, be careful. Lots of people now want to almost play God. You know, uh, Hurricane Katrina came into New Orleans. You saw that on the news. And they now have some of these medical professionals, doctors and nurses and others, that are facing murder charges. And you know what they did? They went around, allegedly, we don't yet have this proven, but what's in the press is that they went around and thought these people are going to die, and so why don't we be nice and speed it up? Let's give them some suicide cocktails or drugs or whatever we stick into them. We'll kill them. And so a number of these senior citizens were basically put to death uh, for fear that they would somehow drown. And, you know, these people, these doctors that did that are now facing charges, and the state attorney in Louisiana said something interesting. He said, we can't play God with people's lives. And you know, he's absolutely right. I think a lot of times we get comfortable trying to play God with our own lives or somebody else's life 
Please understand, God never gave us the choice to go end another person's life. Let me give you a couple lessons and then we'll be done. I won't keep you long. I'm going to believe, number one, we need to protect and defend life like never before. I don't just say that because it's maybe a conservative or a political viewpoint, but how many believe that's a Bible viewpoint? All life is precious to God. You don't need to turn there, but in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, 27, we're created uniquely in His image. Psalm 139, verse 13, we're fearfully and wonderfully made from the moment we are conceived. How many believe each and every life begins at conception? And somebody says, well, you know, if they get a little further along, then we'll protect it. God says, no, the minute it conceives, I know that life. Uh, Matthew 6, 25 to 26 talks about we have a unique dignity and a worth as compared to animals. All life is precious to God. But then could I also point out the Bible's clear, Deuteronomy 32, 39, God gives life and God alone should take life. The Bible clearly teaches a respect for the elderly, respect for the weak, compassion throughout the Scripture. God indeed views each and every life as precious. How many believe we need to stand and defend life? Can I give you number two? I think we need to have the heart of God for what the Bible calls the least of these. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 25. Matthew 25 and verse 35. Let me set a quick context. Judgment Day and the righteous are here. If you have a red letter Bible, you'll see these words are in red. Jesus is teaching. And he's talking about speaking to the righteous. And notice in verse 35. For I wasn't hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Verse 36, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. The righteous from God are getting complimented. Feeding, giving drink, visiting, giving clothes. Now notice verse 37, the righteous are confused. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when... Saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Verse 39, or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? The righteous are being complimented by God at judgment day. And they respond back basically, Lord, we don't ever remember doing that. Now notice verse 40. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. What you do to the least of these, you have done to God himself. You say, David, what is the least of these? I'll put it in real simple context. The least of these is anybody who can't do something back for you. Now, that runs kind of contrary to America. Win-win. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. New, bigger, better, disposable. Hey, we don't need this anymore. Let's go on. And you know what? The least of these are those people that can't do anything for you. How many believe Terry Schiavo was a least of these? Somebody says, David, absent some miracle, she's never going to really be able to say thank you. Absent a lot of effort, she's never going to be able to get a job and earn any money or ever pay you. Why would you waste your time on somebody like her? How many understand Terry Schiavo matters to God. And what you do to Terry, you've done to God 
himself. I don't know about you. I get so busy doing stuff, I don't even see the least of these. I mean, I got to go here, I got to go there, I got to move. And, and you know, if we're not careful, you can walk by them every single day. There's some older folks in this church nobody pays any attention to. They could be the least of these. There might be some disabled people in this community that they struggle day in, day out. Nobody has any real fuss or need to be around them, and they're the least of these. There could be kids in this community nobody cares about. They don't have a mom or a dad that cares about them. They kind of knock from place to place, and they don't have anything to give back. But you know what? They're the least of these. The poor, the people on a foreign mission field, those that can't give anything back. And you know what God says? You do it unto them. You did it to me. And I fear sometimes in America, we've lost our compassion for the least of these. I have good people. I'm talking pastors, not your pastor, but pastors of Christian people, people that are in leadership roles in churches, and they come up and say, oh, it's just as well. She wouldn't have had any quality of life. And you know what they're saying without meaning it? I don't see any value in the least of these. And God says at Judgment Day, I will reward you for how you've treated the least of these. We need to stand and defend life. We need to honor and respect, I say, have the heart of God for the least of these. And then my final thought, and we'll be done. How many believe we need to live our lives in light of eternity? You know what? Terry Schiavo, a lot of debate, a lot of issue, but she's now in eternity. And how many understand if she trusted Jesus as her Savior, how many believe she's in a wonderful eternity? And she lived 41 years. And I hope every person here lives a long time. But you know what? Somebody in this room will be the next to step into eternity. The night of Terry's death, Larry King did a three-hour television special focusing on her life and the whole case and... He asked me a question. He said, David, you fought for Terry to live and she's now dead. What do you want people to think about now? I said, Larry, this case dealt with her quality of life and whether she should live, but she's now in eternity. And I think it's a good time for everybody in America to ask themselves this question. Are you ready for the day you will die and step into eternity? eternity. And you know what Larry King said? I don't think he expected that out of a lawyer, number one. He said, Mr. Gibbs, that is an amazingly deep and very profound question. And he said, we will get back to it right after commercial. And you know what? Never did. But you know what? A lot of people are that way, aren't they? We want to kind of act like we're going to live forever. But I challenge you, make sure, A, that you have your eternity secure. And I would certainly think on a Wednesday night, most of the people here have trusted Jesus as their Savior. But then could I challenge you to live your life and make decisions in light of eternity? Give you a little story. Pastor's wife, her dad was unsaved. And he had said clearly, if I'm ever sick, if I ever have a heart attack, do not keep me alive. He then went a step further. He signed a living will, which was very pro-death, and he signed a do not resuscitate order, and he gave them to his daughter, this pastor's wife, and said, anything happens to me, I want to be gone. One day she gets the phone call. Your dad's just been rushed to the hospital. He's had a major heart attack. You're his next of kin. What should we do? Well, she knew her dad was unsaved. She knew if he died, it was hell for all eternity. And you know what she did? She ignored his wishes. 
She said, do everything you can to keep him alive. And boy, they went into heavy-duty care. She called her husband a pastor. She said, honey, daddy's dying. We don't have a lot of time left. Would you give it one more shot? He said, honey, I'm going for you, but I don't know that this is going to do any good, but let's try. This is a man they'd witnessed to for literally dozens and dozens of years. They went in, and her husband went in by this desperately sick man, now on a ventilator and a heart machine and all sorts of life support just keeping him alive. And he presented once again the gospel message, and with the man hardly able to speak, kind of grunting and nodding, her dad, they believed, prayed, and trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. He came out and said, Honey, I, I'm telling you, I think he did. And she's like, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, he's probably just doing that to make us happy. I really hope he did. Another week, ten days went by. They finally came to the family and said, Man, you know, you probably should have never done this. But, you know, it, it's time to pull the plug. I mean, he's dead. These machines are just keeping him alive. And, you know, it's time. And they prayed and said, Well, if he's already gone, go ahead. And they did what you would call pull the plug. Interestingly, her dad did not die. Proceeded to live for another two years. Recovered fairly well, went home, started reading his Bible by the hour every single day. Would not miss a church service for the last two years of his life. Became a faithful prayer warrior and called his daughter and her pastor husband every day to thank them for not letting him die, a lost man. And somebody says, well, yeah, but I thought he had a document. How many understand when you live life in light of eternity? First and foremost, do they know Jesus Christ as their Savior? Because literally, that's the most important decision anybody will make. You say, well, Mr. Gibbs, do you believe in living wills? I really don't, because most of them are very pro-death. Uh, tragically, one of the lessons that came out of the Terry Schiavo case is, you know, go get a living will. Uh, most living wills read like this, kill me. Kill me quickly, and I won't sue. I mean, they're written by insurance companies and doctors. There's nothing Christian about them at all. And so I encourage you, as you look to your future and to your family, that you make sure that you do it in a Christian way, living your life in light of eternity. I may say, Brother Gibbs, I'm going to stand and defend life. Brother Gibbs, I want to indeed have the heart of God for the least of these. For the Gibbs, I want to make sure I'm right for all eternity, but I'm going to live my life and I'm going to make decisions, not based on quality of life down here, but on quality of life up there. You say, Brother Gibbs, would you pray with me? That's my heart. That's my spirit. Would you raise your hand all over the auditorium? Father, you've seen our hands. Far more importantly than an uplifted hand, Lord, you've seen our hearts. And Father, as we deal with this sad tragedy in the United States of America, as we think of what a nightmare the Schindlers went through, Lord, we also think of the seven to 9,000 people a year that will die in the state of Florida the same way. And we don't even know their name. Lord, we think of the men and women across North Carolina that they don't have any family to stand up for them. But Lord, I pray as the people of God in this great church under the leadership of Dr. Beatty, Lord, I pray that we would protect and defend life. Father, I pray that we'd have the heart of you for the least of these. And Father, I pray that we'd live each and every day in our lives in light of eternity. Do a work in each and every heart. 
move in our midst, Father. Let us seal decisions in prayer with you this evening. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And all God's people said, Dr. Beatty, you come. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. First of all, as Christians. Secondly, as member, as citizens of the United States of America, I think we all need to make determinations that we're going to stand up and be counted for what's right. Stand up and be counted for life. There's been a wavering in your life. As you think about eternity, the Gibbs said it right, all decisions should be weighed, ought to be weighed in light of eternity. Tonight, as we've been brought face to face once again with eternity, as the Spirit of God has chosen to speak to your heart, if you feel you need to respond to that, we want you to come. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you now to do a work in our hearts that will make a difference both in time and in eternity. I realize and recognize that things are being allowed to happen in this country that our forefathers never anticipated, never approved. We realize we've sown to the wind and we're reaping the whirlwind, that unless there is a return back to you, that our nation cannot continue on its present course without your judgment. Lord, we realize you've taught us in your word that if we would repent from our sins and Turn from our wicked ways that we could hear from heaven. And I pray that you will help us to be willing to turn, to repent, and allow you to do your work through us efficiently and effectively right here in this land. During these moments of invitation, I pray and ask now that you will touch us. And if there are others tonight, for whatever reason, openly and publicly need to come to this altar, I ask you to allow them to do so and help them to do so in Jesus' name. We sing a stanza of invitation. If someone else needs to make your way down here, whatever the need is, the needs are, we ask you to come as we sing. One step. Just as I am without one plea. just in a few moments, but I have noticed in the last few days just talking with pastors across our state, I have noticed that there's a general just unconcern, not a real genuine compassion and a general caring attitude about the condition our country's in. Thank God for those that do. Thank God there are those that do. We praise God for those. But there's so many that don't. And Dr. Gibbs and I were talking about this on the way to church tonight. And I'm convinced, after over a third of a century of ministry, I'm convinced that there's a withdrawing of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in this world. Just as God turned away from the Jew to the Gentile world. The book of Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, especially the 11th chapter. And he grafted in, contrary to nature, the Gentile world into the olive tree. I believe God is getting ready to graft the natural branches back into that tree. And by so doing, just as that pendulum swung 2,000 years ago, away from the Jew to the Gentile. I believe that pendulum is now swinging back to the Jew. 
And in the process of that, there is a withdrawing of the convicting power of the Holy Spirit in this world. There's a lethargy, a callousness, an unconcern. I believe it all started to a great extent in 1973. Roe versus Wade. When all of a sudden we said it's okay to take the life of the unborn, who are just as much alive as we are tonight. And I said back then, euthanasia will be on the list in the future. And life will be cheapened. And I've lived to see that. Life is cheap. What Dr. Gibbs shared with us tonight ought to cause our blood to boil. Here was a lady that was as much alive as we're alive, who was murdered just as if they had taken a revolver and put it to her head and pulled the trigger. There's a place in this city the same thing can happen all over this country. It's disturbing. As long as we're at this church, as long as I'm the pastor, we're going to blow, we're going to sound the alarm. And we're going to say there's some things that's wrong, and we're going to talk about those things that's wrong, as well as talk about the things that are right. Yeah. We're, going to, we're going to have to stand up and be counted. And I want to thank you, dear folks, here at Berean Baptist, for standing behind your preacher Amen. as we try to make a stand and make a difference in our country. Appreciate you very much. Dr. Gibbs, we're honored that, you'll be, that, you, that you could be with us tonight. I'm glad that you can tell the other side, and you need to get his book, that explains what the news media has not shared with you. He's coming back to talk to us just a moment. Just real quickly. I want you to be seated just real fast. Uh, we do a monthly newsletter. How many here get our newsletter, The Legal Alert? A number of you do. Uh, ushers, do you have some envelopes? To do? Come on up here quickly. You do not receive our newsletter, and you would like to. Would you raise your hand just quickly? I know many of you do, but you do not receive it, and you would like to. Would you hand those out for me, ushers, just quickly? That lady right there and that lady, just make sure. Uh, don't feel obligated. It's just if you would pray for the cases as we're involved in this. And I would ask you to fill that envelope out just quickly. We're going to collect them right back up. Uh, that lady right there and some folks over there. Just at ushers, thank you. Right behind you there, sir. There you go, that young lady and this lady over here. There you go. Thank you, gentlemen, for your help. Uh, did everybody get one that wanted one? Just raise your hand. They're coming. That young lady. There we go. Once you get that envelope, if you'd fill it out just quickly, we're going to collect them up in just a minute. Uh, we've discovered that envelopes that get put in Bibles remain there till the rapture. And uh, we will send you each and every month a legal alert. We'd ask that you pray for the cases. Uh, if you can help support a little bit above and beyond your church support, we'd certainly appreciate that. But we covet your prayers, and we'd like to send you that newsletter. As your pastor mentioned, I have a brand new book. It's called Fighting for Dear Life. And uh, it is a greatly expanded version of what you heard tonight. Uh, the untold story, uh, you'll go behind the scenes in the courtroom. It's kind of written uh, in a novel type way. It's all true, but it, it leads you along and kind of gets you in the excitement of it. Uh, and it also will give you everything you need to do to protect your family uh, all the legal documents and other things are contained in this book. Uh, it's endorsed by Governor Jeb Bush, among others. And this book is a message book for me. I am passionate to get this message to America. And if you would help me take this message, I would appreciate it. It's a wonderful book to give to bosses, co-workers, unsaved relatives. Plan of Salvation is in here. And uh, we have it on the back table. All the proceeds go to CLA. Uh, it all goes to a charity. None of it goes to me personally. Uh, but we ask $15 for one copy. Uh, it retails at almost 20 uh, in the stores. Uh, if you say I could get two copies, we would do two for 25 or three for 30 And so if you'd like to pick them up, I would encourage you to do that. Um, checks, you can make them to CLA or cash, obviously. They can do credit card, although that's probably a little less convenient for the lady at the table. And so if you could pick those up, I will gladly sign them. Uh, if you're patient, I'll even personalize them. So if you say, I'd like this to my mom or to somebody, I will gladly do that. If you don't mind waiting a minute, I will do it. 
and uh, make those available to you. And uh, I would encourage you to uh, help me with this and getting the message of this book to a nation that desperately needs to hear it. If you can't afford the book and promise to read it, uh, in particular, widows, single moms, number of folks in difficult circumstances, give me the privilege of giving it to you. I'd be honored to do that. And again, it's been a thrill to be here. Thank you for your friendship and your prayers. Uh, did you get your envelopes filled out? Are the envelopes filled out? If you've got them filled out, start passing them to the aisles just quickly. Pass them to the aisles quickly, and the ushers will pick them up. Again, you will receive the legal alert. That's a newsletter each and every month where you can pray for the cases and know what's happening across America. And again, I would encourage you to meet me at the back table, if at all possible, to pick up some copies of the book and help me take this message to America. You say, David, it's a bad day for us. I just challenge you with this final thought. What kind of America are we going to hand to our children or our grandchildren? And you know, we're many of us will be in heaven and we'll be looking down on them. And I very much think we'll say, you know what, I wish we'd done just a little more for their sake. Thank you for your friendship. Again, think the world of your pastor and just honored to be in his pulpit. Dr. Beatty, thank you. I want to ask the ushers to get our offering place right quick, if you will. We want to receive an offering, and what you give goes to him. Our church has for years been supporting Christian Law Association, and uh, we're glad to do that. But uh, we want to receive a special offering tonight to help him on the journey. And aren't you glad we've got Brother Gibbs and CLA out there uh, to help us in the time of need? I was discussing something with him tonight that I'm facing just, I know, in the next couple of years. And uh, he's done said we'll be there. And I appreciate that so very much. And uh, <clears throat> I want to give a good offering to him tonight. Come right on up to the front, if you will, with the offering plates. Let's stand together. And then after we receive the offering, uh, he'll be at the book table. You need to get this book, take it home. Be a good gift to give at Christmas time. Guess what? Christmas is just around the corner again. And... Uh, <clears throat> This uh, three for thirty dollars—that's ten dollars a piece. You go over here to the bookstore, you'll pay probably eighteen, nineteen, twenty dollars for those books. So it'll be a good gift for you to give. Father, thank you tonight. Bless the offering now, in Jesus' name.